Uh, joining us right now, though, at the table, this is not gray at all. An exclusive interview with OpenAI's CFO, Sarah, Sarah Fryer, at the table. It's nice to see you. Nice uh, to see you we Andrew. talked to Sam uh, just about two weeks ago now when ChatGPT5 launched. Um, there was a little bit of consternation uh, in the week since about sort of what is going on with the model, some shifts in the model. I will say that it seems like it's gotten a little bit better from some of the, the problems that first emerged right out of the gate. Have you been experiencing this? So, I mean, I think with any launch, when you have 700 million weekly active users, you start to find people are very opinionated. They've come to love their chat GPT. And frankly, as we've released things like memory, it's become more and more your chat GPT. But as we've come out of the gate, we're seeing actually acceleration in Plus and Pro subscriptions. That's a good sign. People are seeing a lot of value. And we're seeing really nice momentum in the enterprise, great momentum with developers. Well, that's where I was going to go. Coding yeah. and developers. This, some people have tried to describe this as an anthropic killer. Mm -hmm. And so my, I want to understand what you think has happened in the last week. I know Cursor's obviously taken this on and has made it its default. Yes. But what are you hearing and what kind of reaction are you getting from the coding community? So developer outcome was actually great. I think our numbers were up something like 50% just week over week on the number of tokens and so on being used. What we see is um, tokens in particular for agentic behavior and so on almost doubled. Reasoning, which is what I get really excited about because that's a place where I think we've really extended our lead, was up 8x in terms of usage of the reasoning components of the model. So okay, so tell me about this. Motion. Sam has a dinner, mm -hmm. I believe out in San Francisco. He does. And he Many says at the dinner though, this is the famous dinner in the last week, where he mm -hmm. says that there could be an AI bubble that's taking place. Do you believe there's an AI bubble? And I say that in the context that there's apparently a secondary sale of some of your private stock uh, that some of your employees may be trying to sell at a $500 billion valuation. So first of all, I think what Sam said and what I fully agree with is we think AI is the biggest thing, the biggest era that we've seen to date, right? Those of us who've had the, the benefit of living through the internet era coming upon us, mobile era, AI is bigger than all of that. And I don't think any of that is slowing down. You look at infrastructure builds and so on, which you all care about, those stocks. Um, in terms of can there be moments where people invest in things that don't come to fruition? Absolutely. Happens in every era. And I think that's what Sam was saying, is that there will probably be investments made that are not the best of investments. But we still feel like the AI era is upon us and that we're leading the pack. Let me ask you front. something, actually. As somebody who thinks about that, there's a lot of people who are trying to create startups, yeah. AI-related startups, yeah. and just other startups. And what kind of moat anybody is going to have around any kind of business in the future, given that arguably, if this works as well as it's supposed to, we should be able to, I should be able to build anybody else's company mm -hmm. and break through tomorrow. Yeah. So I, I think a couple of things, when I talk to VCs in particular, I always ask this question because they're thinking about their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so what I look for in an investment around AI right now is, Number one, are you solving a real problem? It sounds really trite, but sometimes I think people try to solve problems that don't really exist in the world. Second, is there a true business process that's quite complicated? I think in a lot of cases, people are looking for the shiny bright object, but there's a lot of just hardcore, like in my world, like finance, that now can be done agentically with t really complex business processes. And then do you have access to data that is unique? I think the stat is something like, it's a good chat GPT question, 90 plus percent of the world's data sits behind right. closed doors. It sits in university settings and company settings and so on. And so can you access that in an appropriate way? That's what I think builds competitive moat. But I do think that we're moving into this world I call it of abundance, where you're right. Like if I want planning software for as a finance person, I don't need to go buy off the shelf anymore. I can build internally the best planning software for open AI. Now, we still work, though, with companies like Salesforce. Right. For example, you asked about GPT-5. They were one of our real reference customers. They're using it for agent force. And so it's a good example where even the world of enterprise software, they're grabbing hold of this. And I think the leaders will lead by continuing to Okay, let me ask you a data it. question. Because yeah, people have also talked, and, talked about if you have the data, yeah. uh, that can be a super valuable component part. Mm -hmm. I had long thought that Google should be the winner of this whole ballgame because it has my email, it has my calendar going back almost two decades practically, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. And yet, one of the things that's happened even in the last uh, couple months now is 
you, ChatGPT, and by the way, Anthropic and others, Our can effectively is. port in yeah. to that same data stream. Yeah. Now, so there's two questions. One is, should Google be allowing anybody to port into that data stream? That's what the customers are demanding, so they think they need to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you would do it. And B, if that's the case, it may very well be that this idea that data is the sort of gating factor, data will always be the gating factor, but it may be that those who have the data are going to have to open it up to everybody. Yeah, look, I think when customers say it's not Google's data and it's not you know, and any software data, it's my data, right? This is what um, I've done with my employees, with my customers, and so on. So we've all built connectors in. It's actually been one of the reasons the enterprise business has been so strong. If you look at our business in the last six months, what's really outperformed, ChatGPT has been amazing on the consumer side, but what's really outperformed, what I see, is enterprise and API. And that's connectors happening. Because again, as people come to work, they expect to be able to do an enterprise search and for it to be able to go look inside of my Slack and my email and my calendar and so on. So it's making it incredibly valuable. Um, and then as we look forward, I think what you're starting to see is memory getting overlaid on top of that. It starts to really understand who I am, both right. as a professional or as an individual. And you connect that data to what I am and how I like to search. It's blowing open the search market. I think we've gone from something like 6% share overall to 12% in six months. And I think that underestimates, by the way, because when you are doing a conversational search in ChatGPT, you probably go back and forth five, six right. times. That doesn't count as five, six searches, which is what Google would count as. It counts as one. Hmm. So I think we're really underestimating how much bigger search is becoming, but how much share we're taking. Can I ask you a big sort of economic question? And we were talking yeah. about the Fed and how the economy is going and everything else. And one of the things that's happening is whatever you think is happening with tariffs and everything else, the economy is absorbing a lot. Mm -hmm. In large part, I would argue, because of the AI boom, the amount of money that some of the big companies, Microsoft, Google, and others, and yourselves are spending yeah. uh, on yeah. CapEx, and, and, it, and it trickles into the economy in so many ways, whether it's in construction or electricity or engineering or energy or real estate, all of it. This either gold rush, it's either a gold rush or a sugar rush. Mm -hmm. And how long that, how long you think that build out really lasts? Because it may take several hundred people to build a data center, but it only takes five or 10 to operate it. I think we are so in the early inning. I think a lot of prognosticators want to call it like we're on the sugar rush. We're not. It's more like the railroads or the build out of electricity than anything I've seen. The internet, it turns out in hindsight, was actually a relatively capex light build out. And so I think we are just getting started. Now we have to do a lot to figure out how to make data centers more efficient, to think about new ways to power them. But in terms of AI, it is voracious right now for GPUs and for compute. The biggest thing we face is being right. constantly under compute. Um, that's why we launched Stargate. That's why we're doing the bigger builds, as you right. see, with Microsoft, but with Oracle, CoreWeave, and so on. And we're just getting started.